This is Math 151. We are just going to look at 3.3.1. We're not going to look at all 3.3 in this lecture. <clears throat> but we're going to get at a couple of uh, understandings or relationships in derivatives. And let's start with, with constants. So in other words, um, that was going to be an f. f prime, the derivative of, of some function. So uh, I'm going to say my function is a constant. So like it's 7. No matter what x is, the output of this is 7. Right? Like, like when x equals 5, the output's 7. The output never changes. So if I think of this as the rate of change, it would be 0. And this is true for any constant. If, if f of c, uh, sorry, f of x is a constant, then the derivative is 0. Another way to say this is, those are d's, uh, the derivative of some constant is 0. If I take the derivative of constant, I get 0 because it's constant. It's never changing. And it's actually pretty easy to show with that definition of, of limit. That, well, let's see, um, f of x is c f of x plus h is also c. This thing always spits out c. Uh, c minus c is 0. 0 divided by h is 0. So the limit as h approaches 0 of 0, well, it's 0. So constants, uh, when we go to take the derivative, give us a 0. So there's our constants. Powers. And I'm going to do the do the rule first. Um, if f of x is x to the n, and if you've taken a calculus course before, uh, you've seen this. You've seen this definition. This is this is one relationship that pretty much everybody uh, remembers from calculus. Uh, so the derivative is what the power was times uh, times x times the variable, and then that power is reduced by one. So um, the derivative of x squared, 2x to the first power. Or if f of x is uh, x cubed, say, the derivative of f, f prime, is I bring that power out and multiply by it, and then the power gets reduced, 3x squared. That's, that's anything. Like if I had x to the 10th, and this is with powers, the derivative is 10x to the to the ninth, and uh, let me, I could I can show you that that works. Uh, I'm going to say that f of x is x to the fifth. That would be trying to find it using my definition of limit. Now I have to take this x plus h to the fifth power, so I have to multiply by itself five times. And uh, I don't know if you, you know there's a there's a there's a pretty good shortcut for a relationship I should say for taking um, a binomial to a to a power so like a plus b to some power and you can go off Pascal's triangle um, but notice that like this three is is one plus two right this six is three plus three this four is one plus three this is Pascal's triangle. Um, a plus b squared is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Notice it's 1a squared, 2ab, 1b squared. Uh, a plus b cubed, the coefficients uh, are, are in the next row then. So it would be 1a cubed plus 3a squared b plus 3 a b squared notice how like the the powers are starting to stack over to the other variable plus one b cubed so squared cubed fourth fifth power so if i actually expand this out and multiply it out it's going to be the limit as h approaches zero of x to the fifth plus five x to the fourth h plus ten x cubed h squared, right, I'm using this row right now, plus 10x squared uh, h cubed 
minus x to the fifth. All right, so here's what's going to happen. That x to the fifth is going to cancel out. Uh, you know, because it adds to zero. And so what I'm left with now, if you think about now, I could also start to reduce my h's. So this first h will cancel with that h. Um, this h goes into all those, right? So it's it's not gone. It's divided into every piece. So this has an h. This would have an h squared. This would have an h to the third. This would have an h to the fourth. And so what I have is uh, the limit as h goes to zero of this 5x to the fourth. That doesn't have any h in it. But notice every other term will have an h in it. There's only one h in the bottom that can that will cancel out that term. I would need an h squared to get rid of this. So like everything else has an h in it. 10x cubed h plus uh, 10x squared h squared, etc. h is going to run to zero. All these things that have h's in them go to zero. So I'm left with 5x to the fourth, which if we just um, go back to our relationship, that's what that would be according to that rule. And I, I'm gonna, I could wave my hands a little bit, no matter what, uh, let's say this was like to the hundredth, right? This would be x to the hundredth. This would be, well, it would be 99. Uh, no, it wouldn't, sorry, it would be 100 x to the 99th h, and it would blah, 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 all the way down, and then the last term would be minus x to the hundredth. This term's always going to cancel out with that. That first term's always only going to have one h in it. Everything else, as h goes to zero, will drop out. So there's a semi-formal, mostly informal uh, proof of this relationship for powers, but what's nice is now, if we have a power we're freed from using the limit definition. That feels good. That limit definition is a lot of work. So again, if I said that f of x was x to the fifth, according to this relationship, which we can now use, uh, my derivative is that. And I would write, I, I'm saying the exact same thing when I use this Leibniz notation change of this function with respect to x. So I know that uh, if I take the derivative of a constant at 0, I know that if I um, take the derivative of just a x to a power, I know what I can do to it. Bring it down, reduce that by 1. So here's, a, here's another relationship for us to just think about. If I'm adding two functions together, if I'm adding things uh, together within a, within a derivative, I could take the derivative of the pieces and then add them together. Now there's an assumption that both f and g are differentiable here. Like you can actually get answers for these. But this is, this is a good relationship. Um, if I said it another way, if j of x equals f of x plus g of x, uh, yeah, g of x, then the derivative of j is the derivative of f plus the derivative of g. And that just feels right. Like, that just feels like it should happen. It also happens with subtraction. So if those are being subtracted, I'm just going to turn those into subtractions. Those are all good. So addition subtraction, you can do it uh, a piece at a time. Now if I'm multiplying by a constant. Let k just be a number, like 5 or 7 or something like that. Um, if I'm multiplying by this constant, not, not adding, but if I'm multiplying by this constant, I could say it's just the constant multi uh, multiplied by the derivative as well. Let me give you an example of this right now. Um, g of x is 5x to the fourth. And I want to find g prime of x. Now, you, you don't have to like break it up this much, but let me show you what this is saying. I'm thinking of my, my f of x here as x to the fourth, and five is some constant that's just multiplied by it. So this is the same as um, the derivative of five times x to the fourth is the same as five times the derivative 
of x to the fourth. So we, we, we're not taking the derivative of the five. Five's like a, a scalar. Um, and I know that this would be five times, well, the derivative of x to the fourth is four times x to the, uh, to the third. So this would be 20x cubed. And in practice, what you, you usually do is you probably just bring down the four and go, oh, five times four is 20. And then I reduce that exponent by one. Here's the other thing this does for me with the addition subtraction. Let's say that j of x is uh, 7x cubed minus 3x squared uh, plus x minus. So I'm going to find the derivative of j. Now before, before I had these relationships up here, I had to go the limit as h approaches 0 of 7 uh, x plus h cubed minus 3 x plus h squared plus x plus h plus, you know you you remember all over eight like it's it would be so much work so now that i can just use those rules well i can take the derivative of each of these pieces they're just added together so let's see, the derivative of 7x cubed, right? I, I'm, I'm, you wouldn't write this out, but I'm just going to take the derivative of the pieces. So this would be the 3 comes down, so 21x squared. This would be 2 times 3 is 6x. What's minus, though? This would be a 1. And this is a zero since it's a constant. Think about x. It's x to the first power. If you use that power rule, one times x to the zero, x to the zero is one. Or another way to think about that, remember we're finding the slope. We're finding the rate of change. The rate of change of this is, is one. Think about this as a line. The slope's one. So there's my derivative of this, and it is like heaven compared to using that limit definition that we were working on. Now the limit definition hasn't entirely gone away. Like it still is a thing um, because not everything's a polynomial. We haven't dealt with things like square root. We haven't dealt with things like sine yet. We haven't dealt with, uh, with, with many things. But in this little case, this kind of polynomial case, we're in really good shape. Uh, I'm going to do one more, one more thing. So I have my function f of x defined as this, and I've been asked to find the equation of the tangent line when x equals 1. So when x equals 1, well, let's just evaluate it. When f is 1, well, what point am I, am I going through? That's what I'm finding here. Uh, 1 squared minus 4 times 1 plus 6. I think that's a 3. So that goes through the point 1, 3. So whatever the shape looks like, it's going to go through this point 1, 3. Okay, so now I need the slope of it. And I'm going to get that from the derivative. I can do it a piece at a time. x squared, power rule, 2x to the first. I don't need to write the first. Uh, 4 minus 4. The derivative of x is 1. And then the plus 6 is 0 because that's a constant, right? So what I've done is I've taken the derivative of each of these pieces because they're added together. So there's my general equation for, for the slope of the tangent line, for the derivative. And again, I'm doing this when x is 1. So now I can find that slope by plugging a 1 into this. 2 times 1 minus 4 uh, looks like a negative 2. So I know my slope is negative 2. Now, um, there's a couple ways I could think about writing this equation. You know, if I, I could use y equals mx plus b. And if I go that route, m is negative 2. I know it goes through the point 1, 3. So I could plug 1 in for x. I could plug 3 in for y and then solve for b. The other thing I can do is I can take advantage of the point slope formula. In other words, I know a point and I know the slope on this line and point slope formula is y minus the y component 
of the point equals the slope times the quantity x minus the x component of the point. So in this case, y is 3, so it would be y minus 3. Slope is negative 2, and the x component of the point is 1, x minus 1. So I have that there. And just to show that they would be the same, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to solve, solve this one for b. So uh, y is 3 when x is 1. So 3 equals negative 2 plus b. So it looks like b would be 5. Um, so let's see, distribute that negative 2. Add 3 to both sides. <laughs> yep. Negative 2x plus 5. So feel free to use point-slope formula. Um, the homework might occasionally ask for slope-intercept. You know, just go ahead and put it into slope-intercept. Now, we have not dealt with multiplying functions together or dividing functions. That's what we're going to talk about next time. So get this practice in, and I, I do suggest uh, you maybe start to pick away at the next lecture a little bit, a little bit early. Send me any questions that you have, message me, put them in the forums. Short one today, huh?